afternoon. Seems like you've had an awesome program the past two days. And um, Jordan Campbell invited me to come speak to you all because I live in the world of disaster planning, which feels a little morose, <laughs> down, negative, whatever. Um, but it is, for me, my passion because I grew up in the arts my daddy plays guitar and is a musician. My mama is an artist and she was a public school teacher. And I ran an art center for a number of years and we ran into a number of emergencies. And our neighbors in Joplin, Missouri, this was in the Missouri Ozarks where I worked, um, had an EF5 tornado hit in 2000. 11 or 12, sorry, it's been a long day, I can't remember now. I don't know if you remember seeing it on the news, but it hit me that in the arts and in arts organizations, artists and their studios and creative spaces, we are very vulnerable to disasters. Um, often our spaces are in places that um, maybe are cheaper to access, cheaper rent, but we rely on whoever owns those buildings to have insurance or to have a plan in place, and often that's not the case, so we are a bit vulnerable in that sense. So today my hope is to empower everyone with some um, disaster planning skills, some mindsets that we can take away today that might help protect whatever creative spaces that you have, and also um, to have a conversation about the work that you do, and maybe I can adapt um, some of this to be best for whatever spaces that you are working in. So, my name is Leah Hamilton. I work just down the street at the University of Kentucky, and um, last weekend, Obviously, I know there are many that are not here today because of the effects of Hurricane Helene. I am a transplant to Kentucky from the Missouri Ozarks, and I have to tell you, even though I live in this space all the time, I did not imagine hurricane, a hurricane traveling as fast as it did to get to where we are in Kentucky. So what we know is that the severity of disasters, the number of them is increasing. And the best thing that we can do is, in the arts, plan for our creative workspaces to be prepared, but also plan for how we can help communities recover. Because we know that in the arts um, and our culture that we are the best positioned to help communities be resilient and to recover. So, let's see. Okay, sorry, Tyler. Okay, there we go. 
This looks so formal. But okay, we're gonna first talk a little bit about the role of arts and culture in disasters, a little bit about emergency planning. I'm gonna give you some resources and worksheets, and then we're gonna talk about like a training exercise. Um, bef oh, maybe there's just a delay. Let's see, or maybe I need to hold it in a specific space. Thank you. Okay, next slide, thanks. Okay, so the formal part. Um, in terms of planning for your creative workspace, whether it be a studio or an organization, it just, the biggest takeaway is it never ends. The thinking about the being aware of things that we can do to make our spaces safer. It's not like we can just write a plan and be done. Um, it's, it's a constant awareness of what is happening in our communities that could put our creative spaces at risk, what is happening on the broader global level that can put our um, places at risk, and um, also what's happening just within our own family and our, in our own creative spaces that can put us at risk. Um, if you have sharp tools or kilns or you have musical instruments, these are all things that can be vulnerable. Um, in a disaster. So we know there's preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. And all of these fancy words mean mitigation is thinking long-term about ways we can create our, or make our creative spaces safer. Um, like every once in a while checking downspouts. This sounds so sexy right now. But, you know, looking around your facility or your studio to say what are some things we can do long-term with the space to make it safer, whether it's better gutters, whether it's moving things off the floor, um, having pallets so that if we do get even an inch of water in the basement, it's not gonna soak those precious um, archives or inventory of your art artwork, um, or your instruments for that matter. So then there's preparedness, which is what we're gonna talk about today, like planning, what, what steps can we take to plan in terms of who we talk to, who we um, communicate to. Response is what happens once the disaster occurs. I think many of you have probably seen in the media the varied amounts of responses to those who are needing just those basic needs of food, water, shelter, but we're also seeing artists. Um, for example, there's the River Arts District in Asheville where, you know, the the flooding reached levels where entire studios and the inventory, the work in progress is all underwater. So response is something to be thinking about as well. And then recovery, and recovery is not just physical things. How do we replace our, our equipment, our, our instruments? How do we also help ourselves, our mental health, um, to get past the disaster? Okay, next slide. So, the past two years, I spent time talking to artists, um, creative workers in Kentucky. Um, in 2021, a hurricane hit Western Kentucky, or multiple, hur um, excuse me, multiple tornadoes hit Western Kentucky in 21, in December. And then um, there was flooding, severe flooding, catastrophic flooding in 2022 in Eastern Kentucky. So I've spent the past 18 months to two years talking with them about what are some lessons learned? What can we, what can we learn in the arts so that we can help ourselves and our sector do better? Um, this picture is from John Harden, who is on the board of the Bowling Green African American Museum in Western Kentucky. They were they had minor damage to their space um, from the tornado, but then two weeks later there was an electrical fire because of the tornado damage that put a lot of their archives, their photos, their letters, their just critical pieces of culture from that area at risk. And over half of it, um, either you can see there's soot damage or there was just, it was damage beyond repair. But what they did is they worked with their fire department as well as museum professionals, 
the Corvette Museum to put to freeze some of these items before they could um, repair them and salvage them. So it was a real community response um, to try to save some of these precious documents that archived the, the African American and black culture in Bowling Green. So some big takeaways is that the arts and culture sector um, became a lifeline to communities, but they were not incorporated into formal disaster response. And by that I mean emergency management never really knows what's going on in arts and culture, and arts and culture we never typically reach out to people in emergency management, unless they are in our circle because of being a part of family or friends. So that's something we can do. Um, as a tip is to think about who our local emergency managers are and how we can get them to know more about the work we're doing, the festivals we run, the events that we have, the work that we do in our spaces that is very unique to being um, part of arts and culture. Okay, we also know that nonprofits and individual artists lost work, they lost their productivity, those that had major losses in their space they just didn't feel like creating for three to six months. They didn't even know if they wanted to create anymore. And so what do you do if that's your main source of income for six months and you don't even want to create anymore? So this is something that we have to think about for ourselves, but also for our broader community of artists is how can we support them during that time when they you know, don't want to create so we can keep them on their feet um, until they're ready to create again. We also know that the existing response system did not have any information on arts and culture. Go figure. I always consider the arts to be a vulnerable um, sector. We um, are typically under-resourced and um, we don't fit into that typical mold. Um, when I did my focus groups and interviews, FEMA was such a dirty word. I even hesitated to bring up talking about it after a while because everyone became so impassioned about how hard it was to try to apply for assistance, to feel like that they were included and even considered. Because here's why, typically federal policy hasn't considered a musical instrument a tool to be recovered. But that can be your main source of income. So for the past 10, 15 years, We've been doing advocacy work to get FEMA to change their policies to consider artists and their creative spaces. But it's gonna take more time, so if you ever feel like you have a soapbox <laughs> to stand on about the tools that we use um, and how it should be considered with funding systems in a response, please do. Um, okay, and here's another one. Majority of artists and arts organizations did not have a disaster plan, even a basic one of who to call, and what to prioritize, and they also did not have insurance. I'm talking more than 70% of the 80 artists and arts organizations I talked to did not have insurance. Because it's expensive, and we don't know if we're gonna have to use it. So if you need, if you have precious resources, um, you may need to spend that on something that is more short term, I need this now. And it makes sense, but also I think it's good to know that this is a problem. Like how can we make insurance more accessible to our sector. Okay, all right, thank you, Jordan. So again, I mentioned that, yeah, FEMA, I think has, um, a, has it is considered a dirty word for people that have been through disasters or have read in the media, but I will tell you that there is some good work happening um, through their new whole community approach, and this one I wanted to just highlight came out in January of this year. This is the first publication from FEMA to recognize the role of arts and culture in emergency planning and response, which is good that we're starting to see this. This is actually something you can download if you're interested. You could just Google fact sheet on arts and culture FEMA, and you can download it and take a look at it. Something else, and I'll keep saying this over again, is just being willing to reach out and connect to our local emergency managers. FEMA feels so distant, and it, it is, but our local emergency managers shop at the same grocery stores we do. Um, so having them in our communications toolbox uh, can be really, really great. Okay, next slide. So just for a little bit of interaction, um, 
I, I'd love to know if you could talk a little bit, and I can pass the microphone around. I'd just love to hear about what, you know, when you think about emergency and disaster preparedness, what does that look like in your own creative space? Um, and then as we go through today, I'm gonna kind of tailor a little bit of what we talk about as I know more about you all. So I'll just start here. Does anybody wanna, anyone willing to talk or share a little bit about their creative space and what preparedness I say, I, I'll, in my space, in studio, I used to take a video of my equipment and everything and my and pictures of it, documentation, and then I upload it to YouTube. I don't know if that's going to work when it comes time to dispute, but I want to be able to prove that this was my, my work, my workplace. Thank you for sharing that. Because they will use that. They will. They often, um, I feel like, you know, it just takes time to, for governmental policies to reach what we use on a daily basis. So they still say photographs, but videos are just as good, if not better. So keep doing that, and what a great tip for everybody, you know, just to take a minute to video your space. Um, and sometimes it's not even just for insurance claims or relief assistance, which it would work for, but also when you're in recovery mode, many artists said they couldn't remember what they even had. <laughs> they had so much inventory, or you know, go, oh yes, I forgot, I lost that too. So um, I think from a, like a mental health point, it's also really helpful to have that for memory, to understand the breadth of the work that's in there. So anybody else wanna share about Yes, I'd love to hear. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to just talk loudly? That's fine. You're going to tell you. Yeah. I'm back. Things up in the room. Just in case my equipment is in. So, we have a portable hard drive that can just have all the videos and the photos. Yes, cloud storage is, and now it's so free and accessible. If not free, it's, you know, low price. Thank you for saying that. Um, I remember 15 years ago, our finance director at this, the Arts Council I worked at, she would take our hard drive home with her, just so we had something off-site. But now to have cloud storage is such a relief. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. Anybody else wanna? It doesn't have to be something you actually do, but something maybe you'd like to do that you could share too. Um, I'm not an artist, so, uh, but something that has been helpful is to catalog everything. We have a fire safe at home um, where we keep that there and it's, it's, it's supposed to be water resistant, which is not quite waterproof. Um, and also a, fi a fire safe that catalogs things, particularly with a, a list of numbers, emergency numbers for everyone that we would need to contact from insurance um, to folks who can authenticate things. Um, as well as, you know, replacement items, anything that's there to verify what we have, and that is kept separately. So it's just, it is a fire flood safe. Thank you. Also, you know, things that you want, like documents or work, you need to share it. Like, you can't hoard your own things. It's just like when you took school pictures and you're like, why are they sending the five by sevens, the wallet size, the eight by 10? But you don't realize like till something happened to your house and then you realize like your auntie got a copy and your cousin got a copy. So somebody had a copy. So you got to share some of your things. Like even if, I guess if, if even if your files or, or your music, you, you'll be surprised like when the time comes and you can be able, you know, somebody else has your things. And, and even you could look, because like when you said share stuff, so like when I would share all my songs, yo, I just made a new track, I could go back into my scent and then pull up that file, because I had literally had lost some stuff. But I was like, oh, but I sent this track to so-and-so and so-and-so and, and was able to go into my scent mail and then just kind of pull it up. So maybe that helps too. And um, I'm from Asheville, so I'm thinking about all this stuff right now. And so I would say, um, 
even if you don't have a cat, you, maybe you want to buy some kitty litter because people are using kitty litter for like makeshift toilets right now. Um, people are using, you know, kitty litter like to dry out things. So keep some kitty litter. I'm glad you're okay, and I hope your family and everybody is here. Thanks for sharing. You could see it. Um, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to think of the history and <laughs> you have okay, you, you might in your town you might have like an art district, right? Well Asheville has a huge arts district with all kinds of old warehouses and buildings full of artist studios, lot I mean hundreds of artists. And this was the area that was most impacted downtown with the flooding. So all those artists all their studios were flooded. All their buildings, all the buildings on the river are flooded. All the restaurants, the taco, the salvage station, I mean, the chocolate factory, everything you think of when you come to Asheville, it's in the River Arts District, it's all flooded. It all got flooded. So I, I was thinking about what you mentioned about fire safe. Um, drawers and what you're saying about water and the in the eastern Kentucky flooding at Hyman Settlement School they had these fireproof drawers um, with all of their archives of, of Appalachian history okay and then they had it on the floor like two levels so what was so interesting is, and I wish I had the quote from Melissa Hilton, because I just love it. She's like, we had fireproof drawers, but we didn't have a damn fire. <laughs> and what happened is the water got inside, and then it didn't come out. So it soaked the, the books, the papers, longer because they had fire-resistant drawers. So this makes you go, well, what, what are we even doing then? You put in Ziploc bags. See, that's so good. That's good. So I was going to say, there's, you know, it's almost like, okay, then put the fireproof things up higher, Ziploc bags. But all this to say, there's just so many l layers um, that can make it feel overwhelming, too, um, for preparedness. I love the Ziploc bags. Um, so let's go on to the next slide about what is in a typical emergency plan. And I say this as plans can be written, but they can also be verbal. It depends on who's in your workspace, if it's just you or if you have 20 people working with you. I recommend just some of these basics. One is a culture statement, is what I call it. The formal word you may see in other documents is like a policy statement. But I say this because sometimes it's hard to get people's mind around prioritizing this and how it relates to the mission of the work that you do in your creative space. So if you have a statement that says, we value taking time to talk about and look at our emergency plan regularly. And we do this because it's important for our mission. If we wanna be here and we wanna keep people safe that are in our space, people that come in or our staff or our attendees, you know, we, we value this. Because this is one of the biggest problems is prioritizing the time to actually do it. Um, and if you as an individual or you as a team say we value this and we want to do this on a regular basis, because remember it's not just let's write the plan and be done, it's, it's a living document. So risk assessment um, is the next piece. Just thinking about what your major risks are. Now I have something that I brought. Um, one is kind of just to give you an idea of what natural and human-made risk there might be to your space. And it's not to overwhelm you, but it is to get you to think about all the different types of risk there could be. And then you see it kind of, you can rate them based on how often you think it could happen 
and what risk it puts your yourself, others, and your, your artistic um, assets in. So we won't necessarily walk through this, but I wanted you to have it so that you could start thinking about what are those major risks for your space. Now, when we talk about Hurricane Helene, that would fit under um, a low frequency, high, you know, high risk. Like how many times is your community going to be, you know, if you're in North Carolina or Tennessee, Kentucky, hit by a hurricane that turns into a tropical storm? I mean, that's not something that's really happened before. It could happen again. It was the, the infrastructure, the infrastructure that was weak, right? Is that, yeah, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. And that, I believe, is on here. Um, dam levy failure, actually, yeah. Um, so knowing what geographic um, hazards or infrastructure, public infrastructure, those are some things to think about. Um, thinking about insurance. Do you have it for your creative space? Sometimes if you have home insurance and your studio is in your home, they won't count it as a separate workspace. So you really have to talk to your insurance people about the creative work you do because you may need an extra writer or um, if you have like a garage or a, a, a non, you know, a, a separate space even on the land, but it's not in the main part where your insurance is, insurance probably will find a way not to cover it. So it's good to take a look at the insurance policy or at least talk to someone you know and trust about what insurance might be good for you and your creative space, because studios are really tricky if you're someone who has a studio. Um, and then for arts organizations, they often rent other, you, you rent from other um, organizations or private companies, and then you think, okay, maybe I don't need insurance because surely this facility has insurance. A, they may not, but B, that doesn't cover your own, you know, your, the, your creative work that you are doing. So that's something to consider. And then a rainy day fund, you know, this is hard too to put away a little bit into this, but one of the biggest financial needs from artists and arts organizations after a disaster is having three to six months to help cover their basic bills because it takes that long to kind of get through the mental trauma of it um, and then want to create again, but it takes a long time to file these insurance claims. It can take years to get um, your place back to normal, if you will. So having at least three to six months in a rainy day fund is suggested for that reason. Communications, who are you gonna talk to? Who do you need to call? Who's gonna make the decision? I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. Training, this is also something that almost none of the arts organizations that I talk to actually train on their emergency plane if they have one. Either they're required to have one, so they just put one on the shelf, or it's like, okay, event cancellation, ticket refund policy, basics. But it's not talking about, does everybody on your staff know who to call? And I, I, I'll tell people this, like often the first responders in a space are the people that work there at night. It might be your teaching artist. It might be your janitor. It might be, you know, the, the people that are working in your facility all the time. And instead of the people always at the top who are making the rules, you know, I, I think training on all levels, all staff, all volunteers is really important. And I have a way to make it fun, and that's the last piece of this talk today. And then checklists for preparedness, response, and recovery. Okay, next. Okay, so here's the big thing. If you wanna know how can I just create a basic emergency plan for my creative space, think about who is in charge, so who makes the decisions, and if you do events on the weekends and it's not the normal staff that are there for the week, that's something to think about because that means the person who makes the decisions changes. And this often happens in the arts. Um, that we, because we typically are understaffed, under-resourced, so the person in charge sometimes is not the person in charge other times, so. Who to call? 
and when and how. Now we have cell phones, but thinking through also if cell service is down, um, social media is a huge um, contributor to crisis communications, checking in, making sure you're safe. Um, so thinking through how you want to communicate. Is it mobile phones? Is it email? Is it social media? Is it some group chat that you have with a different social media app? Where to go? So thinking about how to evacuate, but also off-site locations. One of the biggest takeaways was people didn't know where to work when their space was destroyed. So they were like, where do we office for a month? And I heard of places, you know, having actors and their families living in the theater for eight weeks until FEMA came through with housing. So I think it's important to think about where would we do our work? Where would I do my work? And then talking through that um, ahead of time. We talked about clouds. There are so many great tips already about how to store documents, passwords um, on cloud storage so that you can access it no matter where you are. And here's the last thing I want to I wanna say before we move on is what matters most. Thinking through what you care about most, obviously life, you know, pets, um, ourselves, our staff, our volunteers, but then also what do you have in your creative space that you think needs to be saved first? You may have critical minutes to be able to take things with you from your creative space. So thinking through beforehand what would those things be is really an interesting exercise. Um, especially if you talk with your partner over dinner. I'm not gonna talk about my conversation at my house, but I was like, really, that is what you're gonna take? Wow, okay. Um, so yeah, be prepared for some conflict potentially with that discussion. But think through what those priority items are. I, the story about, do you remember when Notre Dame um, in 2018 and, and Paris caught fire? Do you, do you remember the, it, it, it was on the global, it was on, media because it was just, it was hard to see this, you know, ancient, I say ancient, historic um, religious space um, catch fire. And what was interesting is they had a plan to get, they had the original crown of thorns in their archival space at, at Notre Dame. And they had already worked with emergency management with a priority list of these are the, the things that we have to get out after humans these are the priority things that we have to get out of this space should an emergency occur. So they had like this human chain of handing out precious archives, artworks, things that had been stored there. The very first thing was the, what claimed to be Jesus' um, crown of thorns was the very first thing to come out outside of ensuring human safety. So I say that as an interesting story of thinking, what do you think is most important in your space? that if it was lost, it would significantly impact you, others, the mission of your organization. Okay, how am I doing on time? Four o'clock? Four twelve, thank you. Okay, so the last bit I wanted to talk about before we kind of go into more interactive is this, who do I contact if I need assistance and where can I learn more? So I wanted to just go through some resources for you. Um, in arts and culture, I wanted to let you know that FEMA actually partners with the Smithsonian, and the Smithsonian has a program called the Cultural Rescue Initiative. And they partner together and co-chair something called HINTEF, the Heritage Emergency National Task Force. And this is made up of 62 national service organizations that are dedicated to arts and culture around the country. So when a federal disaster is declared, HINTEF, at the federal level, has this network of 62 organizations, and that sort of trickles down to every state. This one is particular to Kentucky, because this is where I work. You have state emergency management organizations, but you also have volunteer organizations that go active in disaster, and they all work together. And in Kentucky, we have a heritage response network just in Kentucky. And you can see some of the founding organizations there, um, the Historical Society, we have the, Her um, the Kentucky Arts Council, Kentucky Humanities Council, a bunch of state agencies that are connected to people who, have, who apply for grants and get grants. Like I know 
um, Gateway Regional Arts Center does. And then the beneficiaries of that are arts organizations, creative workers, and cultural heritage. So those that are working in the arts and culture sector at the local level can talk to the state network that then talks to state and federal networks. So this is kind of how disaster assistance works in theory. Um, so if you, like I, I'm thinking right now about Asheville area, there's the Mountain Area Cultural Response Network. Poor Jeff, who had his own phone number listed. Do you know Jeff? I'm trying to think. This is called the Mountain Area Cultural Response Network. I know this is live stream. Don't quote me on that. We can look it up. But he had his phone number listed, and then I've seen that it's quickly changed to email because, of course, when an actual disaster hits, these response networks hear from arts and culture workers saying, we, we need assistance. So let's go to the next slide. If, um, well, let's go to the next one, sorry, just for the sake of time. Okay, so if you are affected by a disaster, if you're planning for an emergency, doing some disaster planning, you should really know about NCAPER, the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response. They are one of the 62 organizations that works with FEMA and the Smithsonian. What they do is they have something called an impact assessment form. They have this form, it's a Google form. You access the link, you say who you are, what the, assess the damage was, and then they connect you directly to all of those federal resources and state resources I just told you about. So it is a one-stop shop by filling out this assessment form. There's one for artists that work individually, there's one for arts organizations, and there's one for cultural institutions. So like libraries, historical societies, Also, on NCAPER's website, which you can go to at NCAPER.org, they have disaster planning tools like D-Plan. They have more information about a program called Save Your Family Treasures, which is through HENTEF. And this talks about how to save your own photos. Um, some wonderful advice already about having some of your family treasures in different places outside of just your home. There's also the Community Entertainment Fund for theater workers, Music Cares for musicians, the Performing Arts Readiness Project, which gives grants to arts organizations, and there's even a field guide about how to navigate disaster relief assistance. So this is sort of a one-stop shop website that can help you connect your arts organization or your studio. Um, next slide, please. If you are in a craft. So if you consider yourself a craftsperson, Surf Plus is a wonderful um, organization that's been around since the 80s. They provide preparedness grants and recovery grants for individual artists. They're usually around $3,000, and there were many artists in Kentucky that accessed this and said it was the quickest and easiest money they got as artists. So knowing about Surf Plus, I think is really helpful if you're a studio artist, a crafter, um, uh, an art maker, okay? This is Kentucky-based resources, but it can go for anybody if you want just step-by-step -step information on preparedness, disaster assessment, mental health, and how to respond if you have um, damage to artifacts or collections. And we can share this um, slideshow with everybody afterwards. Is that possible? That way you have the links. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Um, and if anybody is interested, I have to do, I'm sorry, a small plug, because I'm also a teacher. That's my favorite thing I do outside of research. And I've been teaching um, arts artists and arts organizations about emergency management since 2018 for the University of Kentucky. So we just launched graduate and undergraduate certificates in this area. The four courses are um, just basic overview, but then event safety security, crisis communications. So um, I mentioned that, that if you really have an interest in this and this is something you want to explore further, you can chat with me afterwards, but you can um, go to our website and we have more information there. It's ukyartsprep.com, but I'll, I'll add that to the slideshow. 
okay? So, to end my talk, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about training because this is the piece that I, I find is a gap in emergency planning across the board with um, the arts sector. It's that you may have a plan, but not everybody knows about it, and you don't train on it. So because we're in the arts, I love this exercise because it uses the imagination and storytelling, which are key elements of creative expression, um, through thinking about disaster planning. And it's called, I mean very simply, a tabletop exercise. And the idea is that you think through possible scenarios of what could occur at your organization or your creative space, and you work as a team with that story, and you just discuss using these questions. Um, so, the, does everyone have a copy? Here, let's pass it around. Here you go. Would you like one too? This is something you can even do with your family if you want at the dinner table. What a lively, here, I have three there, sorry. Thanks. I know you've probably seen this before, Joshua. Can we? Perfect, thank you. So the first idea is to kind of, oh, here's me as a teacher, think through you, what you want people to know by the end of the exercise, okay? So for this example, we want to cover who you're gonna call, we want to know where you will shelter in place, and how we would work with the media. Okay, that's the goal of this scenario. Um, you want to keep the scenario realistic, and by that I mean think of something that may be recent, maybe it was a, a close call in your own studio, your workspace, or in your organization, and then use that as the scenario to think through what if, okay, we got, we got through it this time, and nobody got hurt, nothing really bad happened, but let's think through what if this, what, you know, what if it did happen, what if we did, our basement did flood, um, and use that as the scenario. And then take time at the end to kind of talk through and reflect. What did we learn? What should we do in our creative space to make it safer? What are the, the key vulnerable things we picked up? So I have an example here, and just really quickly, I'm gonna read it dramatically if that's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. It was an unusually warm day for January. The current time is 4 p.m. All staff members are working in their offices or roaming around the facility. Jordan, are you, are you there? Can you, you, you're there, okay. A class is currently being held with 12 elementary age students and two contract teaching artists. And there is a fundraising event for your organization this evening at 6 p.m. in the same building. This feels very realistic, yes? Okay, weather forecasters have said that there is a possibility of severe weather this evening, but as the wind picks up outside and it gets darker due to cloud cover, you hear the tornado siren. Okay, so my chosen threat or hazard was a, a tornado. Okay. So, I, with your team, you say, okay, what steps do you first take? Yeah, who do you talk to? Who gets to make the decisions? Okay, the next question, where is the most appropriate place for the students and teaching artists to take shelter? And you might be surprised how many people on your team don't know. So just talking about that, go, oh yeah, okay, I thought it was here, or I never thought about that before. And who is in charge of assisting them? I mean, it's just 12 elementary age students, but sometimes it could be 20 or 30 or more. So who will check the building for any staff patrons or other individuals that might need assistance, okay? So this is where we start thinking about accessibility. There might be issues if people um, are not able to take the stairs. Um, there might be issues if there are people with auditory sensibilities or people that have trauma with storms, children that have trauma with storms. So you kind of have to think through, don't think, oh, this is going to be super easy, we'll just go there. Think through some of those elements of accessibility too, to know who might help those that need assistance on stairs if you're going down, down levels. Um, okay, so this is the fun part if you, if you do this exercise, is creating your own update. It's kind of like upping the game a little bit, raising the stakes, 
Okay, it's now 4.15, and weather forecasters streaming on your phone say the tornado warning will continue until 5. Parents are going to arrive to pick up students at 4.45. Oh, there's this whole other level of working with parents when you have students at your space. And parents are thinking about their kids, and it becomes kind of emotional. So now you talk with your staff. Do parents of the students need to be called? And then you think, oh wait, do we even know how we would get in touch with the parents? Or hopefully the person that brought the kids there, if it was a field trip, would know. Who handles this, and what are their contact numbers? And then what factors need to be considered in making a decision about canceling your fundraising event that was supposed to start at six? And I know many of you maybe went through this just with the hurricane. Do I, do I cancel this event? Do we keep going? What, you know, it's, it's a very difficult decision to make and one best to be made as a team, to be honest. Who will make that final decision though? Once you've had everybody's input, there needs to be one person that has to make that decision. Okay, it's 4.30 and the lights go out. The elementary school students scream. And this actually happened to me, by the way, which is why I put the screaming part in. Anytime the lights go out, inevitably children will scream, I have found. Okay, one of the emergency lights comes on, but the rest are not working. <sighs> okay, and leaving the shelter in place, yeah, it becomes mostly dark. Oh, and the battery on your cell phone is low. Of course. Okay, so then you think, okay, if we have this shelter in place, maybe we should also have some things there like battery backups, flashlights, okay? So are there flashlights, battery phone charges in the building? If so, where are they? How do we calm the students down? If you're a teaching artist, man, there is nobody that can calm down stu students better than teaching artists. Let's sing a song. Let's imagine, you know, uh, it's, it's awesome. Another reason why artists and arts organizations need to be a part of community recovery. Okay, how will staff communicate with each other at this time? One last update, it's 4.50, the siren goes off, but the power is still out. You do not know when it will be back on, although the forecasters have said that the threat of the weather has passed. So now, does this change what you're thinking about the fundraising event because you don't have power? How are you gonna notify patrons? Who assists the students? How do we ensure that parents' concerns are managed? And then what needs to be done in the facility before everybody goes home? Just taking 15 minutes to 20 minutes to talk through this increases the awareness and the ability to respond for everybody at that table. So again, this could be something you do at your, at your kitchen table, you know, just chatting through it with family but this is also something that you can do in your creative workspace. And for those in the arts, it can be fun because man, artists can get really, creative people can get really creative with this and even want to up the scenario. Well, what if this happens, you know? So it, it engages the imagination. It engages our ability um, to tell stories. And I think it's also a really, really wonderful way in the arts to train people. Because when we think of training, Thank you. When we think of training, it feels so sterile or maybe unengaging. So I encourage you to think about using this exercise um, as a possibility. So lastly, you know, some reflection questions. Thinking through what, how prepared did you feel to handle this situation? And as you do these throughout, you know, time, people start to say, oh, I feel actually more, I feel prepared to handle this. But the first time you do this exercise, so when I did with my staff, it was amazing to me. We all felt like, wow, we were not ready. We were not ready to handle that. Okay, what went well in this scenario? Okay, let's think of some positive things. What did we do well? Uh, but also, what could we have done better? And then what should be changed in our emergency plan to better prepare for a situation like this? This can be something great to do right before you have an event. If you have a planning meeting, two weeks before, a month before, you know, it could even be three days before. You may come up with things you can't get done if it's that in close in time to your event, but at least you have people thinking and being more aware. So I hope that the session has given you some practical ideas to take with you. I appreciate you also sharing your own steps because I think that's also the best part of 
being resilient is learning from each other. So thank you. Um, I think, Tyler, if you could go to the last slide. There's my um, email address. I am gonna stay for a few minutes afterwards, but of course, if you think of something or if you want me to send links, um, I'll have Jordan send out the slideshow that you, so you have the links, but feel free to reach out to me anytime. And I appreciate and I'm humbled to be here today as part of your conference. And um, thank you, Jordan, for inviting me. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, any questions or anything you want to, I can pass the microphone away, around too if you have something you want to share. How much is it? It's 12 hours. Now, it, so it kind of depends on, it's all in state, and to be honest, I have not looked at what the tuition rate is um, for this academic year, but it's a 12-hour program, and I know my chair will do anything to make sure that money is not the reason that you don't take our programs in arts administration. So. Don't let that be a reason. You can email me and, you know, we can talk through ways of doing it because um, there are a lot of scholarship opportunities and things like that, too. But it's a 12-hour course, so it's four courses total. So you could get it done in a, in a matter of two semesters if you're interested. And what's great about this is you also can have any kind of degree or no degree. So there's opportunities for people who, um, you know, if you have your master's, or your bachelor's, but also if you don't have a formal degree, then you can take the certificate as well. So, okay. Any other questions?